So, a little over a year ago, I saw a pretty remarkable movie at the Vancouver International Film Festival. It was called The 20th Century. And what made it remarkable is that it was the most aggressively Canadian movie I'd ever seen. I dare say it may be one of the most Canadian movies ever made. And I don't mean that in the sense that it captures Canadian society perfectly, or has something deep and profound to say about the nature of Canadian culture or anything like that. I mean, it does have some elements of those things, but more than anything else, the 20th century is just a film that is extraordinarily dense with very complicated Canadian references and in-jokes, which are delivered through a very surrealist avant-garde reimagining of Canadian history and politics. I like to think of myself as someone who knows a fair bit about Canadian stuff, but even then, a lot of this film went completely over my head. To watch this movie is to consume an extraordinarily complex cultural product that's like one-third caricature, one-third social commentary, and one-third pure nonsense. And it takes a pretty sophisticated viewer to understand what's what. Basically, if we think of Canadian culture as one of those iceberg memes, this movie would almost certainly be near the bottom of the sea. So anyway, let me tell you a little bit more about it. The 20th century is ostensibly about the life of William Lyon Mackenzie King, who was one of the most important prime ministers in Canadian history. He led Canada's longest ever Liberal Party administration and was the man who secured Canada's independence from Great Britain, as well as the guy who led the country through the Second World War, much of the Great Depression, and even a bit of the post-war period. I made a whole other video about him, if you would like to learn his actual story. This movie version of Mackenzie King isn't exactly the same, to put it mildly. At the film screening I attended, the director was there, a guy called Matthew Rankin, and he gave a little talk where he said that he thought of his movie as being like a dream that Mackenzie King could have had. Which makes sense, because as much as the movie does contain many of the broad themes of King's life and times, it is also deliberately wrong in many of the specific details about how all of this stuff fit together in the real world. What results is a movie that is clearly inspired by true events, but in the same sort of jumbled up way that, like, our dreams are inspired by true events. The dream angle is in turn very heavily assisted by the movie's unique visual style as well, which, as I'm sure you've noticed by now, is incredibly stylized and surreal in a somewhat Wes Anderson-y sort of way. So, I will tell you a bit about the movie's plot, and then we can do a deconstruction of some of its themes. I'm not gonna get into too many spoilers, because while I do think that Matthew Rankin's movie has a pretty narrow appeal, I also think that viewers of this channel are probably about as close to a natural audience as he's ever gonna find. So in order to help him out, I'm gonna put a link in the thing below to various places where you can stream this movie online. I'm still not super sure if I actually like this movie as a movie, but I'm also not much of a movie critic. I do, however, think it is quite enjoyable enjoyable just as this very unique cultural object. And since we spend a lot of time deconstructing cultural objects on this channel, chances are you might enjoy it too. So anyway, the film's basic plot, which is as wild and stylized as anything else in this movie, goes something like this. The year is 1899, and Mackenzie King is a young politician living in Toronto, next door to his mother, who is this batty, bedridden shut-in. She has premonitions that her son is destined to meet a beautiful woman and redeem the pathetic King family by becoming Prime Minister one day. And in that moment, I knew that all the torments and humiliations would finally be vindicated. My dear son, the angel has descended. You shall govern this dominion. One day, to his surprise, Mackenzie King meets the woman from his mother's vision and discovers that she is also the daughter of the new Governor General, who is depicted as this sort of totalitarian overseer of Canada, so somewhat out of Mackenzie King's league. There is also a bit of a love triangle, because King is also being courted by his mother's French-Canadian servant, who is out of his league in the opposite direction. King participates in a contest to become Prime Minister, which consists of a series of bizarre competitions involving various Canadian stereotypes. He does well, but is ultimately screwed out of the Prime Ministership, which instead goes to a handsome young fellow named Bert Harper. In his hands, clubbing baby seals isn't the vulgar blood sport of demented inbreds, but the very noblest expression of Canadian manhood. The remainder of the film consists of King wallowing in self-pity as he attempts to navigate competing ideas 
of what he believes he is destined to do, what his society expects him to do, and what he actually wants for himself. But overall, the plot is mostly just an excuse to put King in various absurdist scenarios, which allows the film to explore various themes in amusingly abstract and allegorical ways. So now let us talk a bit about some of those themes. The first theme, of course, is Canadian history. Mackenzie King, as I said, was a real fellow who actually lived. He is quite famous, but I would also say that he is a good example of a nominally important Canadian historical figure who your average Canadian probably only knows the vaguest details about. Accordingly, the film portrays King's entire world as a sort of misremembered historical muddle in which names and dates and places are often wrong, events overlap in various paradoxical ways, and many of the characters are kind of composite pastiches of multiple different historical figures. This is made most apparent from the period that the film is set in and what the movie's title refers to, which is the dawn of the 20th century. The late 1800s were a hugely pivotal time in Canadian history, and as a result, this tends to be the era that most Canadians think of when they think of Canadian history. I remember when I was in high school, the late Victorian era was basically all we studied in history class. But Mackenzie King's political career didn't actually take place in this period. I mean, he was born in 1874, so he was certainly ruined, but he didn't begin his pursuit of the prime ministership until after World War I. So by sticking King in the late 1890s, the film is playing with this sort of stereotypical idea that all of Canadian history takes place in a sort of hazily defined Victorian period, defined by various broad cliches of Victorian culture, as we shall see. The character of Mackenzie King, in turn, is a kind of broad stereotype of how King tends to be remembered in the Canadian popular imagination. He is quite well known for being creepily obsessed with his overbearing mother, a closeness that notoriously continued even after her death, in which he would attempt to communicate with her from beyond the grave. King was also almost pathologically superstitious and an extreme believer in concepts like fate and destiny and premonitions and all that. Many of the film's secondary characters, meanwhile, are based on real-life contemporaries of King. The movie portrays King's main political rival as a guy named Arthur Mahon, who in real life was the head of the Conservative Party during periods of King's political career, and Burt Harper, the guy who beats him in the Prime Minister contest was a real person too, though in real life he was just King's friend and not a rival politician, let alone a Prime Minister. King famously cared so much about Bert that he got a big statue of him erected on Parliament Hill after he died, so casting him in a villainous role makes the film seem all the more nightmarish in a very literal sense. The film's second great theme is imperialism, specifically the highly performative worship of the British Empire that defined a lot of Canadian political culture in that iconic period of the late 19th century. In the film, we see this through the way that there are lots of Union Jacks everywhere and lots of talk and pictures of Queen Victoria, but especially in the role played by the Governor General and the Boer War. So the Boers were Dutch settlers in South Africa who had established their own independent governments in defiance of the British who had conquered the territory from Holland some time ago. In 1899, the British went to war against the Boer Republics, and Canada sent troops to assist the British in what was seen as this heroic show of imperial loyalty. The war was very popular in Canada, boosted by Canadian politicians and newspapers, who pushed all of this hysterical propaganda about how the Boers were a bunch of murderous savages and how the Boer leader, President Kruger, was this great evil tyrant. The outbreak of the Boer War is an important plot point in the movie, and it is introduced in this wonderfully hilarious scene where the Governor General, who is a kind of pastiche character based on Canada's various British governors of that time, presides over this fascistic pro-war rally. In the jungles of darkest Africa, a Bulgarian army has dared to point its cannon at our imperial mother. Boers, the scum race of the Transvaal, half man, half elephant, commanded by a fanatical psychopath, Field Marshal Cornelius von Kruger. Kruger, that drunkard. Kruger, that glutton. Kruger, 
crusade against the cause of good. Now I ask you, Canadians, will you let the atrocities continue? Will you allow the poor filth to contaminate the virgin snow? Now, opposition to the Boer War was mostly concentrated in Quebec, where, then as now, there was a lot of anti-English sentiment, which led many French Canadians to sympathize with the Boers resisting British domination. In real life, this caused a lot of problems for the man who was actually Prime Minister of Canada during the war, Wilfrid Laurier, who, although a pro-war French Canadian himself, also had several anti-war French Canadians in his cabinet. Pro-war English Canadians would often demagogue about this as evidence that that Frenchy Laurier was just a tool of the Boer. The film has a lot of fun with this and it portrays Quebec as this kind of bizarre pacifist cult society under the leadership of a uh, man named Israel Tart. Le Québec sera doux et tendre comme une caresse. In the real world, Israel Tart was a particularly hated anti-war Frenchman in the Laurier cabinet, though his portrayal in the film also seems somewhat inspired by a guy called Henri Bourassa, who actually quit Laurier's Liberal Party in opposition to the war and went on to become a powerful anti-imperialist politician in Quebec. Now today, of course, the Boer War is mostly forgotten, largely because it was such a ludicrous conflict over issues that seem so impossibly exotic and dated today. Fighting over which faction of white settlers should get to rule South Africa was a moment of peak imperialism for the British Empire, with the amount of interest that Canada had in this foreign colonial war representing a kind of peak of Canada's colonial identity as well. In reminding the audience about all of this, the film does a lot to play off this idea that Canada in the age of the late British Empire was just a fundamentally strange society, which of course dovetails nicely with the picture's overall ambition of strangeness. In addition to the weirdness of imperialism, the film has quite a lot to say about the weirdness of Victorian culture as well. The late 19th century was of course a time in which the English speaking world underwent a powerful social conservative revival, which was pursued with a pseudo scientific dogmatism, unlike anything that had ever been seen before. Canada's elite during this period were big believers in the Victorian moral code, and Mackenzie King is actually well cast as a symbol of this, given that he was in many ways a man heavily shaped by Victorian norms, even if he wasn't, strictly speaking, a Victorian politician himself. The movie has a major subplot involving Mackenzie King's twisted and repressed sexual urges, which have been a large subject of historical speculation over the years, alongside all of his other eccentricities. The real world king never married, and this has led to all sorts of theories about him being addicted to prostitutes, or being a closeted homosexual, possibly with Burt Harper, or even having some sort of Oedipal relationship with his mother. The film certainly heavily implies that last one, but also portrays him as having a crippling foot fetish, which he seeks treatment for in various grotesque Victorian ways. But beyond that, the bizarre way that all of the characters interact with each other is clearly intended to be a caricature of Victorian norms more broadly. Everyone speaks to each other in this extremely formal way, and there is this omnipresent obsession with noting and paying deference to social rank and hierarchy. Nobody has an identifiably warm or human relationship with another person, even when they're supposed to be in love. Monsieur King. Oh, good evening, Nurse Point. I know I am not welcome in your mother's house, but I made a cake. Because everyone in this society is so constrained by these rigid rules of social propriety. The deep unhappiness that defines basically all of the characters in the movie, in turn, offers some commentary on why the Victorian moral code was ultimately unsustainable. And lastly, as might be expected, this film about Canada does engage with several broad themes relating to the Canadian identity. I mean, the primary way that this film does that is by portraying how Canadians of the past subordinated so much of themselves to other interests, chiefly the British Empire's political priorities, 
and British standards of cultural correctness. But there are some uniquely Canadian pathologies in here as well. One is a general theme of Canadian patheticness, the idea that Canada is quite an unimpressive country run by inherently pathetic people, and that everyone in Canada kind of knows this and is just resigned to it. A funny running gag, for instance, is how the nickname for the Canadian flag in this world is apparently the old disappointment. Now, the idea of mediocrity as one of the big themes of Canadian life has been around for a long time and is still very much present today. This idea that Canada is never living up to its full potential and does not produce impressive things or people and so on. These sorts of insecurities usually come up in the context of comparisons with America, Canada's big existential enemy. But one thing that is quite interesting about the world of this movie is how the existence of America is never acknowledged even once, which kind of has a funny consequence because it suggests that this imaginary version of Canada is a country that is disappointed in itself, not really in comparison to anything, but just for its own sake. In a few scenes, it is even suggested that Canada was explicitly founded for this purpose. 33 years ago, our most glittering sovereign, Her Majesty, the Queen, christened this dominion with a national sentiment. Canadians, did she proclaim, in happy days as in sad, Disappointed shall you be! Always and forevermore! May the disappointment keep us safe from foolish aspirations and unreasonable longing. This question of whether Canada has any right to dream something better for itself is one of the themes underlining the plot of King's political and personal ambitions, which can be easily viewed as symbolizing the ambitions of the country itself. I like this one scene where he is dancing at the Governor General's party. I am worth more than the sum of my mistakes. Perhaps Muto should be the judge of that. Please don't ruin this for me. I've been preparing my entire life for this. But it's all hogwash, Bill. Canada is just one failed orgasm after another. Look at all these normals, they're so clueless. Oh, I happen to think it is sacred, Lady Violet. I was born to serve this nation. I thought you were born for boot sucking. I won't spoil the film's ending, but the climax of the plot involves this super allegorical battle for the soul of Canada, with a final scene that is quite rich in symbolism regarding the path that King, and thus ultimately the country, chooses as its destiny for the 20th century. So, that's my analysis of this crazy movie. Again, I am not super sure if it is a great film per se. It is not a movie about plot or character, and a lot of people will probably be turned off by some of the film's more extreme or repulsive moments of avant-garde weirdness, which often don't even function as any sort of commentary on anything. They're just weird for the sake of being weird. But for any anthropological explorer who wants to take a dive into the deepest depths of the Canadian cultural iceberg and see how it feels, the 20th century is definitely an experience I would recommend. If you've seen this movie, I would love to hear what you think about it and if there are any themes that you think I overlooked, or if you can think of another bottom of the iceberg movie from a different country that is similar to this one in terms of its expert level cultural esoterica, I'd love to hear some recommendations for that too. All right, see you all next week. Hey everyone, just a reminder that like I said, I did make a whole other video about the real life Mackenzie King. So if you're interested in learning more about him, why not watch this video next?